Hi, and welcome to the Internet of Vibrating Things. I'm Goldfisk. And I'm Follower. And we're much more exciting than Mr. Robot. <laughs> uh, yep, so please set your phones to vibrate and we'll begin. So uh, before we get started, we uh, just want to uh, cover some uh, content advisory. Um, our goal with this talk is to uh, create an inclusive and safe environment for us and you to learn more about uh, sex and technology and how they interact. Um, there are no sexually explicit uh, descriptions or images in this talk, uh, and although we do mention uh, some legal aspects. And uh, our focus is on the technology aspect, and uh, when you're talking to people after the talk, uh, please ensure if you're talking about things that aren't related to the technology that you have their consent and they're comfortable having that conversation with you first. All right, so Bluetooth. Um, it's in your phone, it's in your smartwatch, your Fitbit, your doorbell, your door lock, your, um, your mouse, your keyboard, it's everywhere. Is it hot? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just stand there. Um, so Bluetooth devices are everywhere, they're in your Fitbit, your phone, your laptop, your, the lock on your door, your doorbell, they're everywhere and a lot of people aren't really aware of the security around this. So it makes sense that adult toys are going to have that technology too. Uh, generally Bluetooth internet connected de devices are vibrators because that's sort of the techie part um, and increasingly they're becoming associated with mobile apps as well so there's the internet connection through that. What could possibly go wrong with that? Security, more like sex security, am I right? It's just a laugh, right? It's just sex toys. Like, you know, who actually uses those anyway? So, uh, a lot of people have that attitude, uh, and one of the things that we wanted to cover is what's actually at stake. Um, because it's all very well and good to make jokes about it, but as one uh, manufacturer talks about, they have uh, over 2 million people using their devices. So, what's at stake is 2 million people. Uh, and uh, that starts to become like, hey, this is about people, it's not just a joke. Um, and that's just one of the manufacturers. All right, so the immediate thing is, what if you could hack into so someone's device and control their toy? You turn it on, you make it do whatever you want, that's sort of the immediate thing that comes to mind. And um, a lot of uh, people in the past have said, hey, this isn't really a serious issue, or if I hack a vibrator, it's just for fun. Um, but if you come back to the fact that we're dealing with people here, uh, then in fact, uh, unlawful uh, control of a device like a vibrator actually counts uh, potentially as sexual assault because it's unwanted sexual content. Um, there's not really much legal precedent for this kind of thing because in terms of remote controlling devices, um, so this is definitely an interesting area. So there's a spectrum of, of in, what we call inter intimate devices. Uh, if you have someone that can control your light bulb, uh, it's annoying, um, but it's not something that's particularly intimate to you. But once you start moving into devices like vibrators or at the far end, something that's uh, connected to your life like a heart, uh, like a heart pacemaker, uh, then you start to get a bigger picture of why the issue of, uh, of security in these areas is uh, particularly important. Uh, so then moving on from the control, what happens if people can find out things about you using this? So at the very basic level, what happens if people can find out that you're in possession of this device? Um, particularly in certain places, it's illegal to own a sex toy um, and it is a criminal charge. Um, and in some places, there is a legal precedent of the possession of sex toys causing a, a legal charge. Um, and it's uh, not just overseas either. Um, in, uh, in the US, um, Alabama is one state that uh, bans sex toys. Uh, there's a town in Georgia that does as well. Um, the situation in Texas is a little bit confused. Up until very recently, um, there was a ban in place. Uh, things we've seen have said that uh, it was declared unconstitutional, so it doesn't apply, but it still appears in the, uh, the code when we went to look at it. Right, and then getting even into an even wider sense, what sort of information can a device like this generate about you? Um, so there's all kinds of different data. There's your um, temperature, your session information. There could be other potential sensors. We just looked at one product in particular, but a whole lot of different sensors generating all this personal information about you. And a lot of apps have audio and video chat associated with that. 
So when we started out uh, with this research, we were wondering, oh, what are the potential exploits or vulnerabilities that uh, a, a third party hacker could take advantage of? But then when we looked more closely, it actually turns out you might be more concerned about what the manufacturer is doing and what they're doing with your data. So this is the Standard Innovation Corporation and uh, they're the manufacturer of, uh, of the WeVibe device that we looked at. And so do you want these people looking at your, uh, looking at your own uh, temperature data potentially or uh, real-time data as you use the device about what patterns you like or what um, intensity you like? Um, and what are, what are the implications of who they're going to give that data to? Um, I mean, these companies say that they, they claim that they're very concerned, they keep that secure and secure about their privacy, um, but if we look in their privacy policy, we can say, see that they say, we reserve the right to disclose your personally identifiable, that's your name, with your information if required to by the law. Um, and there's a bit of not much clarity about what if it's not required by the law, but they have other reasons to. So that's a little bit dodgy. And so one of the things is that uh, people can make the argument, well, you know, usage data collection is just a standard part of mobile apps these days. And we want to question that assumption and say, you know, if you're making devices that are, um, that are controlled by mobile apps that are of a more intimate nature, maybe you should consider whether you should be collecting that information in the first place. Because if the information isn't collected, then it's not vulnerable to either security releases or legal enforcement uh, of release of data. Um, so this is the specific product that we looked into and ha had the hardware for. It's wearable, so you can wear it under your clothes. It can be controlled either with a remote or with... Um, and it has two motors, and so it's Bluetooth connected to your phone or the remote. And what do you know, it turns out this device does send information back to the manufacturer. Um, so the temperature data comes from, uh, uh, as we understand it, a thermistor in inside the device itself. Intensively uh, is related to monitoring the temperature of the motor, but we also determined that it is affected by um, uh, like contact with the human body, so at a minimum you can determine uh, probably whether or not a device is in use, even if it's not actually active. Uh, so this is sent once per minute, uh, and uh, the mode intensity data, uh, which is the pattern that you're in and how strong it is, is a real-time event. And so the manufacturer is currently collecting real-time data on uh, how all of their customers are using their devices. Um, so if you're using this specific device, what are the things you can do to avoid this? You can use it as a dumb vibe. It has one control button on it. You can use a remote control, which isn't sending data. You can use the app if you're not connected to the internet in any way. Um, even if you're, if you're communicating using that device with a partner over the internet, it's automatically sending data. But even if you're not doing that, if you are connected to the internet, it is sending data. Or you can block access using firewall. Um, or you can use this tool that we've made uh, using Web Bluetooth. We've made the Weevil Connect, which has basic functionality to use the Vibe directly from your Chrome browser on your phone. And so you can either use a hosted version of Weevil Connect, or you can uh, also run it locally. And all Web Bluetooth connections have to be over an SSL connection. Uh, and so we can't promise you that we're not doing something nefarious, but you can at least check out the code and see. But this is. Uh, that's approaching the solution from the technological end. Um, we're also wanting to approach it from uh, the wider uh, societal end as well. Uh, and so in light of that, we're announcing the private play accord. And so the goal with the private play accord is to pr protect the privacy of people who are using devices like these. Uh, we want to promote transparency from the manufacturers about the data that they can, can collect so that people can make informed buying choices and that the manufacturers that do treat um, the privacy and security of, of people's intimate data seriously, people can choose to, uh, to, to make those uh, purchase choices with that knowledge. Uh, uh, so at the moment we've just recently contacted manufacturers and we have um, some we questions we're going to ask that and we're going to have that on the website that we're going to host for that. And uh, along with that, we've come up with a draft rating system for particular products. 
um, where you can get an at-a-glance view of, uh, of their approach, whether it, they collect data or not, whether it's opt-in or not. And you can help by using some of the tools and techniques we're going to use later by investigating other devices and um, reporting your findings on, on that data that they find. Uh, okay, so that's the implications. Now, how did we get there? What did we do to reverse engineer this? So these are some of the did, things we did, tools we used that you can use too, and of course the, tool, the Weevil tools that we made. Uh, Go first, what about people sitting in the audience who say, I don't know anything about reverse engineering, I could never do this? Well, that's fine, because I didn't know anything about reverse engineering. Um, there's a lot of, basically, there's just a lot of playing with things, looking around, seeing what you can find, a lot of things we just stumbled onto by accident. So, yeah, curiosity is, is definitely your most useful uh, tool when it comes to reverse engineering. So we generally start with, one, with three questions. Uh, what does the device do? How does it do it? And then how can we control it once we know that information? Um, so again, this is the WeVibe 4 Plus. We had the hardware for this, but you don't actually need the hardware of a device to do Internet of Things reverse engineering. You can do a whole lot from what's already on the internet. Uh, so this is the Wii Connect. This is their mobile app that comes with it that you can control your device from. So when you're uh, connected with a partner, um, there's a Bluetooth link between the Vibe and your phone. Uh, interestingly enough, there's not uh, a, lot of a lot of reliability in um, Bluetooth LE connections in these devices because it turns out that humans make excellent Faraday cages. So you have uh, connections from the phone going to the uh, server from the manufacturer and then back out to the phone of your partner. And the finding the statistics uh, API information, which was what's reporting back the temperature and other information, we found using uh, an MITM proxy uh, tool, uh, which performs and enables you to have a man in the middle uh, view between the app and the, uh, the back end server. Uh, now, if you're familiar with Pokemon Go, uh, they had the same issue that this manufacturer has, which they didn't implement certificate pinning, and if they had, then that would have made it uh, more difficult to impersonate the back-end server. All right, so the first approach we can take is hardware. The, uh, any device that's sold in the US that uh, transmits uh, radio frequency uh, is required to be registered with the FCC to be sold in other jurisdictions, other um, certification boards are there. And part of the process is you have to submit a bunch of documents uh, describing how your device works. And it includes uh, internal photographs, which sometimes are really terrible and sometimes uh, actually quite useful. So the one, on the, the one on the right is the board from inside the Vibe and the one on the left is from inside the remote. And so from looking at this, we discovered they use a Texas Instrument chip uh, and it's a really old architecture, 8051, which is often used in uh, really cheap uh, control situations, and then they have a Bluetooth stack uh, associated with that. Um, the uh, compiler that you need to use uh, is a mere $3,000, uh, although there is some uh, effort uh, with SDCC to support the Bluetooth stack uh, and the chip. Uh, there is some evidence that there is the potential for over-the-air firmware updates because there's strings in the app about it, uh, but there was no functionality that we identified in the app that could perform over-the-air updates at this stage. Of course, the FCC doesn't uh, uh, show and share every document that they receive to the public. It's possible for a manufacturer to say, hey, we'd like you to keep this uh, confidential. Um, but sometimes the FCC makes mistakes, uh, and so we discovered that in a later model, uh, the certification, the request to keep this document confidential somehow slipped through. So if you're looking at advice, definitely check out the FCC site for the documents you're supposed to have, and sometimes you might get a bonus too. Oh yeah, and don't do drugs, because if you have a drug conviction, uh, FCC certification is considered a federal benefit, and so you can't get a certification. Okay, what else can you do without actually having the device? You can look on the internet, other people who have taken apart your very expensive device so you don't have to. Uh, this is a Reddit account associated with another manufacturer who do really interesting teardowns of adult toys. Um, and you can see the two motors and the board and the battery in there. Uh, and this is our remote. It was more disposable, so we took that apart and had a look inside. 
Uh, so we know now from the chip and from the specifications that this device is controlled with Bluetooth Low Energy or Bluetooth Smart. Uh, so how can we communicate with that? Uh, the great thing about Bluetooth Low Energy is that it's a set of standard profiles, so we can in that means that we can interact with the device through in, in standard ways by interacting with the standard profiles. So we have each uh, peripheral device, so the um, central is your mobile device, device or the remote. Each peripheral device has a series of services. Um, some are standard, like battery level, but some uh, specified by the person making it. And within those, you have characteristics which you can use to read or write to the device. Um, so we used an app called Nordic Connect. So we, this is just on our mobile device. We didn't have any extra hardware or anything. We can op open it up, connect. And this is the Wii Vibe 4 Plus, which for some inexplicable reason is named Cougar. <laughs> yes, all of them. Um, but none of the other devices, just the 4 Plus, for some reason. Um, so we find here at the bottom some generic services and then at the bottom an unknown service, which then you can see has two unknown characteristics. Um, we find out later that one of them is the control and one of them is the status characteristic. Hey, Goldfish, we should like try sending some data to that uh, device now that we know the service and characteristic, but how will we know what data to send? I don't know, that's really weird. We, we could, I mean, we could just send random data, but that would take a very long time. Uh, so what we can do, we can take, uh, well, either you can use man in the middle to find out what the, your device is sending, or you can use Android logs to um, find out what's being sent over the, oh no, sorry, Bluetooth sniffing to find out what's being sent between either the remote and the device or your mobile thing and the device. Um, or there's some Android logging functionality to see what, what's being sent, but the approach that we took was getting the APK, which is the format that Android apps are distributed in. We're just looking at Android. Um, so you can get that and decompile that and have a look at what's inside. Uh, so this is what we found. Sync pulse command has an integer array. That looks suspiciously like something we could send over Bluetooth. And if we send it over Bluetooth, what happens? It, it vibrates three times. So this is awesome because we know we've communicated with the device in a functional way. We've actually talked to it and told it to do what we want. Now we just have to figure out how, to do, how can we do that better and how can we do interesting things with that. So it turned out that uh, the data that's transmitted is always eight bytes long uh, and the first a uh, byte determines what the command is, and so there's a variety of different commands uh, that the Vibe obeys. Now, obviously, we could stick with using a generic app, and the Nordic app is pretty cool. It allows you to save values to send and stuff like that. But we also wanted to create uh, some software that would run uh, on, on a desktop machine. So we discovered that Node has the best uh, Bluetooth LE support. Um, I guess it's the new hotness or something. So we used uh, a library called Noble for controlling the device. Uh, and there's another library called Bluna, which you can impersonate the device so you can content, simulate the device on your, um, on your laptop and connect to it with the mobile device. Or for the remote, it's slightly different. There's some things going on there, but you can connect to it and it thinks it's the device. So that meant that we could uh, have a connection with the app and then every time we pressed a button or used some functionality in the app, it would send the data to what it thought was a device and then we could see uh, what the device uh, was expecting to receive so we could then send that ourselves. Um, so that was great and we got some great things. We found out how to get the information like the temperature, the modes, the intensities. Um, but we were like, how can we make this better? How can we make this something you can have on your mobile device that has a user-friendly interface? Uh, so we went with Web Bluetooth. You don't need an app for it. It's just a, um, it's in development for Chrome. Um, there's still, we're not quite sure around everything at the moment, um, but this is what we went for as a start for re-implementing the functionality ourselves without needing any of standard innovations um, software. And so Weevil Connect is uh, part of a suite of tools, uh, the Weevil suite of tools, uh, which allows you to interact with um, WeVibe devices. Um, one, there was a really interesting uh, or useful website, uh, which was a template generator for web t uh, Bluetooth uh, software development, so you can basically say this is the service we want to interact with, this is the characteristic we want to uh, interact with, and it will gener uh, generate a, um, a class which has all the boilerplate stuff that you can then just say send this sequence of bytes to this characteristic. Uh, now we learned some other things along the way which were uh, the in invitation Oh, okay. A little bit of invitations. Um, they there's don't expire. weird stuff going on. They don't expire. Um, other stuff. We will release. We're going to release re release this um, for you to use. Lots of different things in there. Have a look. 
There's other cool things, other cool things going on. Privateplaycord.com. Find us at Rancid Bacon and Goldfisk with a zero and a K. Um, yeah, we'll put all that up. That'll be up in the next day or so. Uh, thank you so much for having us here.